back and bigger than ever. It's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Sooner Scoop crew, Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. All right, we are back. It is the unofficial 40 podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com, where Eddie, Josh, Carrie, Bob is not available today. Uh, we are in a musty smelling office as we just had the flooding incidents continue to plague sooner. Scoop. I mean, I swear to God, everywhere that I go, it just it, it, it I feel like I'm the bad luck charm for everybody right now. No, nah, th- we've had flooding problems before. Uh, we had a little pipe blockage in the in the office. Yeah, at least it's not from above, right? Like above. I, that's what I'm. Yeah. I mean, we've had flooding from above yeah. where we know it was a toilet. flooding. I'm done with flooding from above. Believe me. <laughs> How is the, uh, the compound? What, what is the update on the compound? The update is there is no update. I live in a tarp town, basically. I've become part of the mud. And it is, uh, we'll just say that I had the conversation with the, uh, the office people. And uh, oh, the corporate my, people. My, my patience has worn thin. They promised it, it's moving in the right direction. It's just taking a little bit longer than I was hoping it was going to. Did, they, did you get a sense that they knew how powerful you were? They know who I am. Like, I, I would say that. They, they know what I do for a living. And I, I kind of, like, gave, like, a crazy little, like, I've been pretty easy about this. And we don't want to get this public, right? And kind of laughed. It was like a threat. It was like a veiled threat. So they kind of know what, what's to come if they don't get this thing figured out here soon, soon over the, uh, the compound. It's, there's only so much I can take. I w- and your parents are probably sick of you, and you're probably sick of your parents at this point. No, I think that they. Well, I think my mom loves it. I don't know about my dad, but <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's become quite a situation. Well, we are here this week, uh, and in between uh, junior days, basically. I mean, that's what's going on with with OU football. Is uh, you know the, the players have arrived on campus. You're starting to see some Schmitty workout stuff floating out there, but. Uh, really, uh, we're, we're kind of in the doldrums because, uh, nobody really wants to watch OU basketball right now, especially after that shit show last night. No, I, it's, it's, you know, and I, not calling for anybody's job. Like I, I would start there. So, you know, that this conversation is headed in a pretty dark direction, but, uh, I think that there are some like big major questions as far as the direction of the program right now. And, uh, if Porter Moser can get this thing kind of fixed. And, you know, I, last night was kind of a, a tipping point for me as far as it's unwatchable. Like, that was not competitive last night from the get-go. You fall behind 11 to nothing. Uh, you know, at one point you enter, you, you go into the first TV timeout at the under 16. They probably had just as many turnovers as they had, like, actual shots on the basket. The style of play, like, and I... <laughs> I give him shit all the time. Like there's one thing that like Todd Lisby, who I work with in the mornings, like he's a big basketball guy and like the style of play, what Porter Moser's trying to do. I just don't know if it can be done in the big 12. Uh, and that's like a bigger picture. Like, can he do the same things that he did at Loyola at Oklahoma? And it's a little bit unfair, but it's what he signed up for in the toughest conference in the country. Like it's just not working right now. And the guys that they went out and got in the transfer portal, uh, you know, I, I'm really not trying to shit on these kids, but Tanner Groves and Jacob Groves should not be getting the minutes that they are at a big time university. They just yeah, they can't. I mean, I, I go back to Greg you know, has gone missing. Like he's soft. Yeah, and, and I go back to you know the summer and all the caravans we were going on and yeah. listening to Porter and just how distraught he seemed about the portal and the direction of college basketball, like. And he has a leg to stand on, I think. But is Kansas State and Iowa State paying the transfers that they went out right, and got? Right. Are they like just opening up the bank and to they, get them? And they completely new teams as well. Right. I mean, and the it it shows me like they've got better coaching because OU it, it's like you said, soft is a very good word, and you wouldn't think that from Porter Moser because he's he he is a very intense person. Yeah, I well, and I think that what we saw last night particularly was a team that has fallen short in these close games, the six losses by four points or less, and it was almost kind of a point of and I'm he they he rides those guys very hard, yeah. and I think last night when you get down by twenty eight, you saw that team quit. 
Like it, they were just kind of like, F this. And that's we're checking that's out two times now where they quit. Well, and like we, we played a uh, interview with Kevin Henry after the game this morning, and he's talking about culture of the program. It's January 25th. And you're talking about the culture in the program a year and a half into this. Like that's not, that's a, when I hear that, that sends off like alarm bells, like something's not right. Like I'm at the point right now where it's like, would Notre Dame be doing OU a little bit of a, a service would by OU taking just say Porter Moser off his hands? Buyout? Like, please. But the way that he they've played and the resume that you know Porter Moser quote unquote has built at Oklahoma, like I think the 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 question is, would Notre Dame be interested? Yeah, and that's not a good thing. And you know the 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 style of offense they scored nine points in eight minutes last night. Or excuse me, I gave him an extra point. Eight points in nine minutes. <laughs> like the style of play, I just don't know how you're going out there, and especially if you're dipping into the transfer portal and having to re to overhaul a roster, how you're selling that to guys. They have the slowest pace of play in the country of any power five team. Slowest pace of play. I'll say this. Why I do mean, people want to come play in that? And why do people want to go watch it? And that's that's the even like bigger macro kind of conversation as far as everybody well, I knows. Have that. I want to have that because, look, I've been going, I mean, I'm 50 years old now. I've been, I've never seen OU play a home game in another arena besides the Lloyd Noble Center. Like, and it wasn't, when I was a kid, it wasn't a Taj Mahal either. Like, everybody has forever has complained about how dead the Lloyd Noble is, how, you know, dark and just depressing it is. Like, forever. I mean, there was a time when, like, they redid the ceiling. It's like, and everyone's like, oh, it's so much better now. Like, and, you know, it's not so dark and, and dank and all this. And, and it's like, oh, you, from Watch generation to generation, from generation to generation, has passed off the Lloyd Noble as somebody else's problem. And Joe yeah. Castiglione's done the same thing. He's tried to pass it off on the city. Like, it is time to put a lot of effort into building a new campus facility for basketball. Yeah, and especially it's time to take bulldozers to that place and rebuild. I mean, it's it's beyond past time. Like the basketball program is basically, I feel like it's cursed. And I know they've been to the Final Four and all that. Kelvin did it. I mean, but look at Kelvin now at Houston. I mean, he hasn't gotten worse as a coach. I mean, that's a whole other discussion, right? About, you know, right? Why he ended up gone, but right. but I mean. There is no life around OU basketball. And I know Porter's frustrated, and he's been frustrated with it. And, you know, he came in here year one and was like, yeah, we need a new arena. And then you could tell administration's like, don't do that. Yeah, I, I, you, you almost get the feeling, and this is complete speculation on my part, that, you know, if he had to do it all over again, Porter Moser never signs up to take over this thing. He did, so you have to live in that reality. But, like, I, between the support of the program and between the product that they're putting out, if – you're not overly concerned about the overall just environment of what OU basketball is right now. Uh, you're either, you don't care, which I think that there's a lot of people like that, or you're just kind of overlooking some obvious problems. And now granted, Jenny Bronchek plays in the same arena. I'm not saying that they're filling the place by any means, but they're a competitive basketball team. Yeah, And that kind of, you overlook a lot of stuff when you're winning. Although I'll say this, you know, it's it's not difficult to be a competitive women's basketball team. They're not a lot I of think great that's fair. basketball it's, programs. It's fair. And like, like again, there's a reason like South Carolina is becoming good. Sure. Like they're they're pouring resources into it. Like Connecticut poured more resources than anybody else into their program and they became good. It's like there's only a handful of teams that can win a national championship in women's basketball. And OU isn't at that level. Not yet. But it takes it takes a commitment to the program financially. Uh, it, let's face it. I mean, OU is operated in a way that says basketball is not a big revenue generator, so we don't need to put a lot of money into it. At some point, you have to make up for what all these past generations of athletic directors and presidents haven't wanted to do. And you have to bite the bullet and do it. it the time is beyond past. Yeah, and it's a culmination of this. This right now feels like a culmination of years and years like you've said like i mean i'm i'm willing to make t-shirts that have lloyd noble arena picture on it and just say fix it 
I don't know if people would get behind that or not. I think that it would, they would sell very, uh, people would be apathetic to it just like they are to the, <laughs> like they are to the program. They wouldn't even care to buy a t-shirt. Maybe retweet, but not get involved. And like, I, again, it's tough to say, they come, this. come watch this, or it's come to say, you know, come be a part of this when it's a very stale, very boring product. And especially if you're not winning. Yeah. I, so uh, the, the good news is they have the number two team in the country coming in for uh, the SEC Big 12 Challenge on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at the very least, you would hope that it's they go out there and compete and bust their ass. And I'm not saying that this, this isn't a year-long problem. Last night, I think, was just kind of the tipping point as far as people becoming frustrated with what they're watching. They have been in games, but I think that the way that things went down last night, you kind of go, well... And the way things that like really truly started in the second half in Stillwater, despite them even it was a five point game with seven minutes left, and then shit hit the fan. But like it, it is just it feels like we're all kind of avoiding the inevitable as far as having these conversations. And I feel like that time should be now that you have those conversations uh, before it gets even worse than what it already is. Yeah, I, I mean not, you're looking at I'm not I'm not willing to pick a fight, but I am I am willing to start one. Yeah, like it with who? With the administration. Oh. It I mean, I, I think that like and I had this conversation with my dad last night. It's like, you know, you, you see some of the freshmen that are out there right now. I like what Otegua has. Yeah. Losuzon's hit a little bit of a wall, which is understandable. He's playing in the best conference in the country against some of the best backcourts in the country. You're gonna hit a wall. That was should should have been expected. Uh, you know, Benny Schroeder, who knows really, Luke Northweather, who knows? I can't sit here and say, and I might still be wrapped up from last night, how many of those guys even want to come back? As big as the transfer portal is, like, they could jet if they don't like what they've been a part of this year. Uh, you're already having to probably go back in and rehaul a roster for the third year in a row. The first year wasn't necessarily his fault. It just, I don't know. Like, I, I am ov overly concerned right now about the direction this thing is in. Yeah, And I think that the, like there is a serious conversation to be had just as far as like, can Porter Moser do what he wants to do at a university as big as OU in a conference in the Big 12? And I know they're moving to the SEC. Maybe things are different, but like the big, the SEC is just as athletic. Like I was, I know that there's not Alabama a lot of people that like him. killed Arkansas and Arkansas just ran away with that game when they right. played OU earlier. Like, and I know a lot of people don't like him, but I agree with Doug Gottlieb, like, the SEC is very athletic. If nothing else, it's very athletic. Yeah. You can't run set play. Like, last night, they, they couldn't even get into sets offensively, let alone They're run them. They're a terrible offensive rebounding team. They get out-rebounded I mean, all the time. And I, I know everybody wanted Joe Bamasil to get in, and he finally gets in last night. It's a tough spot to be in, down 27 to be thrown into game for the first time in the year 2023. But he gets blown by by Mikey Miles. He gives up an offensive rebound, then he doesn't even – attempt to block a guy out and then he jacks up like two or three threes that were just ill-advised early in the shot clock and it doesn't really matter they were down by 30 but it's like oh that's probably why he's not playing. i'm gonna tell you you earned your your salary last night why you watch more of it than i could stomach i couldn't like i like it was like a train wreck i couldn't stop watching i got to the point where i'm tired of taking shit from people for not watching certain shows on tv like did you start After Jack time, I no, I haven't done that. That's another one. But I finally finished season one of Ted Lasso last night, which I'm sure makes Josh proud. Uh, well, I mean, there's a blend of shame that you hadn't already done it, but you know, I mean, I guess you know, better late than never. It's a really good show. I, it's incredible. I, I, I I'm ready to start season two, but I finished season one last night. I mean, I went. I think I'd only watched half of season of, of episode two. I made it through all 10. It, it it was one of those things where, like, and I remember the first time I saw it, because, you know, obviously, guys, I watched the, the Premier League and all the commercials that basically birthed that whole idea was this series of, you know, uh, Jason Sudeikis commercials. And, you know, and I know everybody knows that, but, like, I thought it was going to be that. And I was like, okay, this will be funny for a year or so, and then it's just going to be so hokey and stupid. But, like... The, like two or three episodes in, you're like, this is actually really good. Like it's it's funny, of course, but well, you know what you know what like, sold me on it is like, 
you know, you have YouTube shorts now, and so I'm always on YouTube. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, there were the, – the, they played I, – I was flipping through the shorts, and it had the scene with the dartboard in the pub. And I yeah. saw that, and I was like, I love this, man. I have to watch this, this, this show. And I think that is the best embodiment, like, of, of what he is. Like, so, I mean, like, uh, it's easy to laugh at some of the things that Ted Lasso doesn't know and doesn't understand and is basically naive about. Yeah. But at the same time, like, you're like, he's a really likable human being. Like, I mean, like, you wish you knew more people like him. And I love the, I love the owners, owner, the owner, the, the ex-wife of the owner, uh, or the owner, well, however you want to say that, the woman that now owns the team, like yes. her character's great. Uh, the yep. idiot soccer player that gets, you know, I don't want to say too much, but uh, you know that everybody hates. Like he's great, and that veteran's great. Like it's just a great setup for a TV series. You'll like Roy Kent even better in season two than he did season one. Like he, he, you get to see more of like what he's about. Yeah, and he's a great character. Yeah, he is. He's really like I almost want, you know, with the news that they're just going to do this final season, like I I'm wondering if he doesn't get some sort of spin-off like where they do something with him hmm. and if that can work. No, but I'm glad I started. I'm looking forward to to season 2. So, mhm. I'm a I'm a kindred soccer spirit with Josh McQuistion now. <laughs> the first time ever. Uh okay, so Josh, did you ever get into Jack Ryan? No, and and I like I have like I've read several of the books from like you know Tom Clancy yeah. forever ago. Like uh, my grandfather read a lot of those, so I got into them and would read them when I was fairly young. But I've never done it, and I like John Krasinski a lot. Like I kind of keep meaning to get to it, and then I'll, something else will catch my eye, and I start watching it. Um, like for example, last night I, I watched Bullet Train. I had never seen that, and I was kind of interested to see what that was like, and. You know, it it was fun. Like, I mean, it was kind of stupid, but it was fun. Like, it it, it worked on some level. Um, Is Krasinski but, you know, in I, Bullet Train? Uh, no, uh, Brad Pitt is oh. is Bullet Train. Um, Johnny's own. Well, I knew Brad Pitt yeah. was, and then and then the guy that was uh, uh, the fast guy in Avengers and all that stuff, the British guy. Uh. He was in that movie called Savages with uh, Taylor Kitched and yes, yeah, and, that uh, guy's, and he's really good in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, it took me a second. Savages was a great. Book. Oh, it's a great movie. Kinda, Nobody yeah, knows about was... that movie, but it's a great movie. It's mm-hmm. got uh, yeah. Blake uh, Lively is the main. Yep. It's a threesome basically. Taylor Kitch, that guy, and, and Blake Lively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. And Selma I Hayek if... is like a drug lord. Sounds good. Which, I. I it's mean, a good if you movie. put Salma Hayek in anything, and I'm going to be invested. So, so sign uh, Josh up for the new Magic Mike. Yeah, yeah, I'm in. So, um, but now, uh, you know, I, I don't even know where we got there. But so, yeah, yeah, this is the time like, of year I, when I people start watching, watching shit. something yeah. else. But the the idea of Jack Ryan, like, I'm always into like agent stuff. Like, I, I love it's stuff badass. like that, like espionage. I loved it. It took me a long time to watch Zero Dark Thirty, but I finally saw that, and that was great. Yeah. that's one of those movies it's like it's a hard watch you know like you're like i don't know that i need to go back and watch this a lot but i recognize that it's really good yeah one of those movies was on last night like i don't ever need to watch captain phillips again i saw it knew what happened don't need to watch it again i i always the one i always go back to and it's an older one that some people listen will be like what the hell is he talking about traffic like years ago like 2002 that's an incredible movie like the drug trade and how a lot of it worked and you could see a lot of it but like you're like I don't like I I feel like I've gone to work to watch that movie like it's hard <laughs> to watch. All right, uh, so uh, football. I mean, I guess Josh will just kind of start with you. Just your thoughts on on what's going on with the football program, recruiting. I mean, new offers are going out. Uh, you're having junior days, uh, one last week and another one coming up. Uh, is it was last week bigger than this week is going to be? Is this week just kind of a smaller version? Uh, no, this week, like last week, they had a few kind of str- like Riley Wormley, the 2025 running back from um, Colleyville, same high school that Cody Thomas came from. Actually, um, they, he, that is my annual Cody Thomas work in. I got to find a way every every year to get a Cody Thomas reference. But um, so 
he was there, and I've talked to him a little. He was actually included in this morning's woke. Uh, just talked about like wanting to have a chance to have a little more one-on-one time with the staff. This weekend, you're going to see a lot more. Uh, I think we've got about a dozen guys confirmed. Um, there'll be more. Um, uh, Max Anderson, little uh, Frisco Reedy. You know, I know an area that you're familiar with, uh, Carrie. Uh, little brother of Nate. Okay. Um, Rivals 250 guy that is that just was offered. I think about three weeks ago, if I if my memory serves me, it's it's been fairly recently, and you know, and he had a lot of early attention that Nate didn't have. Um, he's kind of unlike Nate, where you know, for those that don't remember the story, Nate Anderson was really a tight end D end kid until going into his senior year, and his coaches were like, "Man, you're you're 250," and somebody got hurt, and he just kind of made the move over late in his junior season. And everybody was like, holy crap, he's really good. And it just ended up, you know, becoming kind of a national recruit. Max has been on the offensive line track a little longer, looks a little ahead of it, and I think is also more physically developed. I mean, I know you guys, you know, saw Nate that first, you know, spring he was there, and he was 260 pounds, probably soaking wet. I mean, he just had a lot of room to to grow. Um, but then, you know, you throw in other big time guys like Nigel Smith, the big time defensive lineman out of Melissa, uh, their little north east of Dallas, uh, Peyton Pierce, guy from Lucas Lovejoy, one of the kind of real emerging. Those two programs are two of the faster risers in Dallas as far as talent production um, and just, you know, guys that Oklahoma is going to be recruiting in the coming years. But, you know, there, there's plenty. They've got a kid coming. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> one of the more interesting kids that's coming down is Jay Sean Ross, a big kid out of Kansas City has wide receiver film on his tape could play defensive end and you know as good as that area was to Oklahoma last cycle with you know PJ Adabari, Caden Green all those guys like you, they're gonna hope they can keep that momentum going and laying some more of that kind of top area guys that you know whether Brent was at Clemson or Oklahoma he's been very synonymous with with being able to land what have you thought so far about uh, Emma Jones first couple weeks I know that they've been obviously pretty active hitting the uh, recruiting trail uh, you know obviously there's not just a ton to talk about as far as what they've offered and where he's been and things like that but uh, it would seem that he's kind of hit the hot spots right I mean going back into the DFW and places that he's probably not only comfortable with but uh, familiar with I, you know I, I think at some point it's just a matter of getting you know, going to Skyline, going to South Oak Cliff, going to Duncanville and wearing your new gear and just letting people know, you know, this is this is what I'm doing now. This is where I'm at because, you know, those kids know it. But at the same time, seeing it's a little different thing and making sure they know he's going to be just as present coming from Norman as he was coming from Lubbock or Lawrence or wherever he's been in his career. So um, I, I think there's no question he's made a – um, he's made it a clear priority to go after some of the guys he likes. Uh, he's been down to see Micah Hudson, um, who is a guy that I continue to hear his hiring really changed OU's trajectory and, and, and Micah's recruiting. Now, I, you know, does that mean OU's going to land him? I'm not going to go that far, but I definitely expect Micah to take a visit at some point this spring. And I don't know how likely that was, um, previously so I, I think that's good Renton saw Ryan Wingo here in the last 48 hours a big wide receiver out of St. Louis um one of the you know a nut like Micah one of the top three or four receivers in the whole country and uh so I, I think he's done a good job of mixing you know what what is going to be his home base along with I'm at Oklahoma I'm going to re- go recruit the very best elite national guys that uh, you know, I, I think at Tech, he had a, you know, like Micah Hudson talked about Tech as one of his top three schools not that long ago, and it's a school that was likely to get an official visit for him. So for him to now be able to kind of throw out Oklahoma out there, you think it takes that to a different level. And again, he gets to go a little more national because, you know, as, as much as I think of Joey McGuire, and I know Tech is really putting some good things together, they're not received the same way Oklahoma is, and he knows it. What about Josh? What about you know the possibility of, of adding guys? I know we've talked about the name or two, um, but adding guys to this 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 class, the twenty twenty three class, coming up in the next signing day. Anything new brewing there? Well, I don't think 
Yeah, no, was that that was was it last Friday? Yeah, that that the Taylor Heim. Yeah, I think so. yep. I don't think we podcasted yep. since Oklahoma made the in-state offer to Taylor Heim, the uh, the Bethany athlete. Um, you know, and I, though he doesn't go to my high school, a uh, Bethany, you know, was my home address growing up. So much love for Taylor Heim. You, I was just gonna say you can claim him. I I think that that's very fair. And like, I'll be honest, I kind of turned on the tape pretty blind. To like what I was going to expect. Mm-hmm. Holy shit! He he is a guy, and again, he's a guy that every year there's a couple dudes like this that I either notice late or I just don't notice. Like I, I you know, I'm not saying I, I see everybody. I, I don't. I obviously miss guys. He is a guy I was uniquely aware of because of the fact I have some close connection to the Bethany program at this point because you know one of my closest friends his son is on the football team the basketball team like so I, I'm very familiar there and I they've told me they're like you got to watch this kid you got to watch this kid and I had watched him um a, a guy uh, for some that don't know Brian Bedford's a guy that helps a lot of Oklahoma high school um prospects and he's worked with Taylor and has sent me his tape over the last few months kind of hey you know this is his three game this is his five game you know that kind of deal and watching him, you're just like, wow. I mean, he is, you know, he's listed at 6'5", 200. Looking at the tape, that looks pretty accurate to me. I mean, he's a big-looking kid on tape and runs very well. Um, could be a tight end. Could grow, you know, could be a cheetah. Could grow into, I, depending on his frame. Because, I mean, again, like I say, I'm aware of him, but I haven't been in his presence. He could grow into a defensive end. I mean, he is a big, long guy. There's a lot of room for him to develop. And I've got to think that's what, that's what OU liked. And I can tell um, everybody listening, basically what happened is about two weeks ago, Joe John Finley reached out to him and said, Hey, what would you think of a preferred walk on, uh, you know, a spot? And he kind of said, ah, you know, I've got some, you know, I've got North Texas, I've got Louisiana tech, I've got some other options. And since then Tulsa's joined the race. And I think, it was just kind of a, oh, well, you know, okay, you know, man, oh, you were just kind of like best of luck. But I think they kind of fell in love with him. And from that point forward, it was really about Brent Venables. Um, and I know Brent had been, had spoken to him multiple times last week and then finally went to his high school, or actually went to Kiefer, um, kind of out in, you know, Eastern Oklahoma to go watch him at a basketball tournament. And, you know, sat there, watched him on a Friday night and offered him, you know, before anybody had gone to bed that night. So uh, they I, I get the impression they're very enamored with his potential. Now, he's he's super raw. He's not a guy that's going to show up next year and be ready to go. He's going to need some time. But six, five, 200 and can run. I mean, you can find places for guys like that. You know what else is raw, Josh? prime shrimp when it comes to your door it's frozen but yeah, it's raw it man's a professional uh and you've got to cook it you but you just put it in boiling water for less than 10 minutes if you don't know about prime shrimp uh they have changed their packaging a little bit to where it's single serve now so it's you know it's it's 10.99 or 9.99 uh and they put together a new deal for uh, sooner scoop uh, users and uh, podcast listeners uh it is the promo code u40 and what that does if you order five packs of shrimp so uh, let's say you want to get the garlic and herb butter. You want to get the New Orleans style barbecue. You want to get the French Quarter Alfredo, and maybe you want to go Cajun. Get the Louisiana boil uh, Cajun shrimp. Five packs. Enter that promo code U40. You get twenty five percent off your entire order. Uh, so it's a great deal. A uh, great way for you to check out. Uh, you know what Prime Shrimp has to offer. Uh, we've all done it. Josh has uh, scoured those things out. He's a huge shrimp guy. I'm a little bit of a shrimp guy, uh, but I really like him as well. Uh, it's primeshrimp.com, P-R-I-M-E, shrimp.com. They will send it to you. They get the dry ice in there for your kids to play with. Uh, you don't want to eat that stuff, though. Um, and so you take it out of the packaging, put it in the frig- or in the freezer, save it. It's no mess, no fuss, no, no – no, no, it's easy. I mean, you just throw it in boiling water, and in a, under 10 minutes you got a restaurant-quality meal. Uh, primeshrimp.com use that promo code u40 u40 get 25 percent off your order of five uh, packs of shrimp or more i want to be careful about this just as far as like comparison's sake josh but when i was watching taylor heim's video or uh huddle tape from a senior season at bethany it reminded me a little bit of Cade mcnamara in that when you turn on the tape he's dominating 
at multiple positions against competition that you, like when we go out and watch these kids, you would expect that to happen. He looked like the best player on the football field. Would that be, now, would I that did, be fair? I, I think it would be. And, and I, I want to clarify for anybody. I'm sure you meant Cade McIntyre. Yeah. What did uh, I say? McNamara. Oh McNamara. yeah. My fault. No, yeah. no, just did. I like I said. I knew what I knew yeah, where yeah. you were Kate going. McIntyre. Um, he got the and, expensive and, coffee today, Josh. So I think uh, I have I have a little <laughs> beef with uh, the Bucks when we want to get oh, there. Oh no! Um, I thought you were a Scooters the, man. Now yeah, it was easier to get to. Okay. <laughs> the the interesting thing in that to me is does Taylor Heim? You know, like I said, the initial contact was Joe John Finley. So I wonder if that was their first thought and that's changed. And I haven't really clarified that. I, you know, cause he's one of those guys when you ask people are just like athlete, like but let, let it sort itself out kind of thing. And so I wonder if it's a situation where, you know, they, they kind of let both those guys, okay, you start where you want to start and you start where you want to start and then we'll see where it goes. And if it provides them some flexibility in, okay, we, we just like Cade McIntyre better as a, you know, stand up defensive end or, you know, something like that. And it allows them to move him around or Taylor Heim just really takes off as a, you know, as a cheetah type guy. Okay, great. You know, and Cade McIntyre can stay at tight end, you know, whatever the case may be. I wonder if that was something where it was just like, well, now, you, you know, these guys are very different in the way they play, but their skill sets and the way they can, you know, help Oklahoma's roster are kind of similar. So maybe maybe there can be some mix and match there and just let kind of, I don't know, almost like a best man win scenario. We hope to catch up with him. I was going to do it this week. A uh, little bit of scheduling conflict just as far as like he has like four, three or four tests that he has to make up this week. And I was like, dude, don't worry about it. We can, we'll catch up next week. So I think we will be getting over to Bethany uh, hopefully Monday to talk to uh, Taylor just about where everything kind of stands. And, and I do w want to make sure people know he will be, he is expected to take his official visit to Oklahoma this weekend so uh, with perfect. that Tulsa last weekend has done Louisiana tech has done North Texas. Um, I, again, if OU loses a battle to one of those three schools, it's the first time I can remember it happening. And at least in a Tulsa, you can go back a while and there were some things like in the like nineties, but it's been a long time. So I, I, I think we can all probably guess which way that's going. But um, it yeah, is. It's, it, it's, it looks good for Oklahoma right now to land at least one more guy in 23. It, and it is also a little, I guess, bigger picture just as far as it was something that I mentioned to you in the war room, Josh. I, this is one of those evaluations or offers that I just can't ever see happening uh, with a previous regime. Oh, I don't think there's any question that this, this is not this. I mean, cause again, this is a projection thing. And I, I know people will say, well, they loved height, weight, speed guys. Yeah. But they didn't like, they didn't tend to give the benefit of the doubt to Oklahoma kids. Like they, they would give it to Texas kids. They would give it to Florida kids or, you know, like Dante Manning, like when, when he was coming out and his tape was good. But he was also a guy that ran track, was big and long and athletic, and it, it was just a little different. But, I mean, like, it's not just him. Like, you can see in a lot of things they're doing, they are a lot more active um, in the, just in state lines. Like, because you look at – they're already making multiple offers in the class of 2025 in state. And – I don't think that's something that the previous staff avoided. You know, they'd go after the elite guys, but I mean, they they're going after. They've offered Nate Roberts at Washington, who this morning picked up a Georgia offer. So I, pretty clear, if Georgia's offering you as a tight end, you can play some ball. Their, their tight end room is almost like Ohio State's uh, wide receiver yeah. room. It's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, C.J. Nixon at Weatherford, who's a guy that not enough people are talking about. C.J. Nixon has a chance to be a top 100 guy. You watch that dude on tape. That looks. Uh, it's it's a big comparison, but there are some Jermaine Gresham vibes there. Like he has some athleticism that is not normal for a you know a high school kid that's six five two ten right now. And then the Alex Shield Knight kid, which is another defensive end or defensive lineman from the state of Oklahoma. Like it's all there for Todd Bates and Miguel Chavis if they can go get David Stone, Danny Okoye, Alex Shield Knight, 
you throw in Zadavian Sims down in Durant, that's a, a Texas kid, but you know, obviously is in state lines now. And then you talk about Nigel Smith and all these other I mean, it feels like in twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five, Oklahoma can really rebuild that defensive line room if they can close like they have at other positions, you know, so far, you know, under the Brent Venables regime. You know, it's, it's interesting, too. I mean, just talking about, you know, Kevin Wilson being in Tulsa and, and Josh, I mean, I was more in the game then. But, I mean, just you look at, like, the big athletes that he brought into Oklahoma over the years and Joe John was around, you know, watching that go on. Uh, I'm trying to remember what years he would have crossed over. Um, Joe John? Yeah, as a coach, I mean. Oh, uh I mean, it would have been it would have been the oh seven ish period. I yeah, think. that's what I was I was gonna say oh seven oh eight um, before he went to Baylor. Um, and you know, it, I mean, that's gonna be interesting wait, to me. Wait, 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 hang on, hang on. You, are you talking about Joe John as a coach? Yeah, he was a, a oh well, grad he, would, he would have been a player. He didn't start coaching eleven. Yeah, okay, because yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he went to the NFL for a couple years. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So it would have been like eleven, yeah, eleven ish. He that, he would have mm-hmm. been here right when Kevin left. Then, the, but but he played for Kevin. I mean, right. he, he knows. What but I mean, doing. just being around that and, and and seeing you know how he recruited the players he brought in, like I I wonder how much of that rubs off on him. I mean, just being you know because Kevin was great at that man. He'd bring in big athletes. Uh, I mean, you had like a Brody Eldridge who ended up being an offensive lineman, but started out as a tight end. Uh, but just always they always had dudes it, that were big athletes that were versatile. I, guys, I mean, just look at the way they, I mean, you, you know, you, you go back to Blake Bell. Like, I mean, like you go all, like they well, Lane Johnson been was, like, Lane Johnson's yes. the perfect example. Another one. Absolutely. Like guys that were just like, and, and that's why when people are like, oh, this Taylor Heim offer, man, big athletic guys, like they don't, they're not everywhere, man. If you can get one, get one and see what happens. Like the, you, that, then it comes down to, can your coaching staff develop and teach and make this guy everything he can be. Now, I'm not saying Taylor Heim, because he's big and tall and fast, is going to someday be an All-American. I, I don't know. But there are tools there to tell you he can be a really useful player. So, yeah. I mean, and I, I mean, I, I think that's the other thing. Like in, in Jeff Levy's offense, we we saw, you know, Braden Willis basically be the guy that he used at tight end. So, I'm kind of curious to see how much that develops if he felt like he didn't have the right guys in the program. Um, but you know, you saw guys play as an H back, you know, under Lincoln Riley that didn't really get a chance under Levy. So I got to think his run game is going to continue to develop. If they, they bring in guys like that. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, and I know it's something that Gabe talks about a lot. He loves 11 personnel, man. He wants to have one back and one tight end on the field at all times like that. That is a, you know, and they're going to go three wide. So like it is, it's just one of those things where the tight end is a functional part of this offense. And, you know, Kerry, I, I don't know, you know, we all know I like to give you shit from time to time, but at the same time, you were a guy that beat Braden Willis's drum for about three years. And you're like, this has got to be the year. This has got to be the year. I just and wanted him to come back. Yeah. Levy, yeah. Like he, he finally, they were like, wait, he's six, four and runs like a four, seven. Yeah. We can make use of that. I mean, it's, it's, but we feel kind of the same way about David Aguayo. By the way, interesting that he's going to uh, switch to defensive end at Houston, which is what I thought he might be looking to do. What, Josh what do you thoughts. guys make of that? <laughs> like, it, 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 it frust. Like, do you we think can tell that, it frustrates like, he you. went to Oklahoma and was like, "I'd like to try this," and they were like, "No, I, I, I don't, I don't think that would be the way that would play." I don't think that. It, it almost just kind of feels like that was the situation that everybody, and I don't know this for a fact, but it just feels like everybody agreed, like, let's just get everybody a new start. This is, You can go get a new start at Houston. Uh, you know, the, the staff can continue to move on, even though there might be a need at defensive end, or maybe they feel good about what they have at defensive end. It, Which I think you just, would probably I, say is how do, how do they feel so so good about I would, that? If it, if it were... The, yeah, that's my problem. Yeah, if it were... You know, my thought would be maybe if they just were ready to move on, it would be because they got guys like PJ coming in. Uh, you know, they got young guys they want to try and spend as much time with to develop in the spring, and they don't want another development project at that position. Which I, you know, I, I think that maybe there is a certain level of me that 
again, like I, I like David Awegbu. I, as a person, I kind of respect the, you know, if you want to call it processing or whatever you want to call it. I like, I kind of like that, that they're saying, you know, <laughs> we're not going to give you a second or third opportunity here. We're going to move on. We got to, we got to continue to move forward. I don't know. I, I am kind of split in that. The, the argument I can hear is kind of like what you're saying, Eddie. It's one thing to say, our Mason Thomas is a developmental guy after one year on campus. Like, okay, he's got to get bigger. He's got to get stronger. He's got to learn everything. Great. If you teach him all these things and it takes 18 months, you still get two good seasons of football out of him. David Aguebu learning it, learning what you want him to do. He just learning on the job and then he's gone next year. Like, you know, did, did you impede the development of our Mason Thomas? Did you hurt PJ out and his ability to be ready to go, you know, to the, maybe to the sec in 2024, because, okay, we're getting snaps for David Aguebu. And I, you almost wonder if they look back at 2023 and say, did we do that at linebacker? And we don't want to repeat the mistake at defensive end. Yeah. I, I think that that, I almost kind of buy into the idea that that's the conversation that they had, even though yeah. I don't know that for a fact. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's just one of those things where linebacker, I'm like, I see a lot of guys there. I, I can understand that. But when he says he's willing, because like, I almost thought like, oh, you went to him and was like, hey, you know, what, what do you think about maybe, you know, putting your hand on the ground or maybe just being a stand up defensive end or something along those lines. And he was like, oh, no, I'm a linebacker. I'm going to do something different. But when he goes to Houston, is like, yeah, I'm, I'm moving to defensive end, like just announces it. You're like, well. I, I mean, is there a position where OU has a greater need than defensive end? Yeah. And I would even say, like, I, I think that that was the – and I know it took a while for them to uh, finally get to that announcement uh, from Awegbu, but I I think that, that, like, that was the plan from day one. Like, I remember the day that he entered the transfer portal. Uh, I think that we even talked about it here on the podcast that Houston and moving back to defensive end was going to probably be what ended up happening. And um, sure enough, it did. Having TVs in in the office is I think sometimes Carrie a bad is, time. Uh, Carrie is completely blown away by the uh, PGA Tour uh, trade show that we're watching. Matthew Fitzpatrick <laughs> trying to uh, sell off Skechers uh, golfware. Well, what's bothering me is the Skechers guy has a really shitty watch on. Oh, that's what you're watching? <laughs> yes, that's what you're. I thought you were amazed it's by a, the shoe like that a, they're trying to no, sell. No, it's like an Invicta or something. I mean, it's like if you're. Let's be you're, honest. He's selling Skechers golf well, shoes. That kind of I mean, says all you yeah, need to say like, right there. Yeah. Our rep is wearing like Skechers. Get your rep legitimate watches. Like Matthew's got like a Omega or something on. He's got, I, he's an Omega. He's an Omega. Is he an Omega uh, guy? Golfer, yeah, he's got yeah, like I a. I think that's a. Uh, yeah, I think I know what that watch is. There's nobody more uncomfortable than Matthew Fitzpatrick trying to sell these <laughs> Skecher golf shoes, though. It is, uh, it, it is a and very they look uncomfortable like the watch. The Skechers that Joe Montana wears. They're, yeah. They don't even try and make them look like golf Joe shoes. Joe Montana looked good at the San Francisco game. He did. Like Jerry Rice looks. Somebody, good. somebody pointed out that like you only wear that and the shoes that he was wearing if you have a stylist because he was wearing like the. Uh, oh yeah. What were the Converse? Uh, Oh, uh, not the PF Flyers, but something that looked like those. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, we were talking about Jeff Levy, though. I, you, there's nothing to truly add. I know that that's been out there in the news this week as far as Bill O'Brien uh, moving from Alabama to be the offense coordinator with the New England Patriots. Uh, it just, it, I don't get this feeling that as many times as they're going to continue coming back to Jeff Levy and they being Alabama, I don't get the feeling that Oklahoma fans should be all too worried about that right now. I know that like it almost feels like this was like, you know, news two weeks ago and it's just now hitting, I don't know, like the public, but I just don't feel like Jeff Levy going to Alabama is a thing. Yeah. And you've, you've got contacts there that have been, I mean, give you credit. You've, you've been on top of this the entire way. And you, know, every time you've checked back in, it's been like, I don't think it's going to happen. And no, I, it sounds like there's even been a little bit of a, like Jeff Lebby enjoying the, the 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 rumor mill. Well, I know I know that. Uh, but I know. mean, but I mean, I keep telling people this, and it's like they're like, well, so and so went to Alabama, and this guy went to Alabama. Those were all rehab projects. Like they needed Alabama. Jeff Lebby doesn't need Alabama to rehab his career. He is going to get a head coaching job as long as he is successful at OU as an offensive coordinator. 
this is one of the jobs, one of the few jobs where you're guaranteed to get a head coaching job offer if you are successful as an offensive coordinator. I mean, that's why Lincoln Riley got elevated because he was going to get a job somewhere else if, if Bob didn't, you know, say that he wanted him to take the job. Like, it is a lateral move. And he's making $1.9 million this year. He'll make $2 million next year. He's got a three-year deal. He's one of the highest paid assistants in college football. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, you, well, can, you can connect all the dots in, in, that you want. None of those lead to Alabama for Jeff Levy unless they're bumping him up to, like, $4 million or something. And Alabama that, doesn't that, have to do that. No. And, and that's my whole thing. Like, people are like, well, Alabama just pay him more. A, I don't know that that's true. And B, they're not going to do it out of pride. Like, we're Alabama. We don't. Have, it, it's the same thing. In recruiting, like, oh, Alabama's got their NIL stuff going. No, they, they don't have to. They're Alabama. Like, they can tell these kids, come here, start for a couple years, and you're going to be a first or second round draft pick in all likelihood. So they don't have to sell you on the $85,000 a year. You're going to make, you know, $3.2 million on your signing bonus. Like, it, it's, it's just a different conversation they get to have because of what they've done and what they've accomplished. And it's the same with coaches. Like, and... Is that maybe a pride thing in that situation? Sure. But they're not going to say, like, we're, we're going to have to pay you more than OU is. That they'll, it, it, unless there is something that appeals to Jeff Levy beyond money and beyond, you know, like, beyond, like, I don't, I don't even know at this point because we know they've made, they've reached out. I, I've been told they've told, he said no two or three times already. Like, I, I don't think this is like a singular event. Um, and, if that's the case, then like what what, what are they going to come back to him with? Because I, I, again, I just I don't believe that Alabama is going to spend more money than Oklahoma is willing to spend. I, I just don't believe that. And maybe I'm blinded by it, just because again, this is one of those things we're around it so much, and you know, obviously we cover Oklahoma, and again, maybe I'm just blinded by this idea. Uh, but he's back at the place he went to school. He's coaching with one of his best friends in the entire world in Joe John Finley. I just don't get the feeling that he's ready to uproot his family for the second time in two years and move to Tuscaloosa away from a place that, like, again, maybe I'm just completely homer on this subject, but I feel like it's a place that he they're truly happy with where they're at right now in a place that he's always wanted to be at. Not necessarily the offense coordinator at Oklahoma, but, like, getting back here – and getting back around the people that he knows and cares about, I just don't get the feeling that they're ready to move on. And I think that that's something that definitely comes into play. Like, it's just not coaching every day. It's about being happy and your family being happy and everything like that. Well, and, that, and you mentioned it. That's another connected dot. Like, Joe John Finley is his guy. Is Alabama going to take Joe John Finley too? Because they're a package deal. Like, the, I've been told forever that when Jeff Levy gets a head coaching job, Joe John Finley's going to be his offensive coordinator. Just, like, I mean... Look, I want to get back to the – I want to talk about Josh Heupel here in a minute, but, I mean, it's kind of the same way with him. Same same tree, but he just made, uh, you know, Joey Halsley his offensive coordinator. Yeah, and I it just like – and then you get into, like, the particulars about, you know, I, I know that Jeff has told people how excited he is about 2023, and, you know, I sometimes I roll my eyes at stuff like that. You know, you saw Kendall Bryles talking about how excited he was to work with uh, K.J. Jefferson next year at Arkansas, which – you know, obviously he's now in Fort Worth and trying to pursue uh, Jaden Rashada. Uh, that's out there this morning. But it, it, it is, I think, like you get Dylan Gabriel back. You, they obviously have a great relationship. You have Jackson Ardell on campus now. Like, I just don't think that Jeff Levy's the type of guy that is going to just uproot everything and then turn his back on those guys. And sure, like Jackson, maybe he could go to Tuscaloosa with him. I just don't think that that's going to be the case. And knowing how much... Jeff worked his ass off at the end of this 2023 cycle, getting the Peyton Bowens of the world. Uh, and then, you know, obviously some of the stuff that they've been able to pull off in the, you know, transfer portal and things like that. Not to mention he's his own man in Oklahoma. You're always under the shadow of Nick Saban. And, yeah. You know, Lane Kiffin didn't enjoy it. I mean, I'm Steve Sarkeesian absolutely needed it. So he had to, you know, he, he dealt with whatever he had to deal with, but Bill O'Brien, you know, he couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah. Like, it is fascinating, though, that all of a sudden you look up and Nick Saban's 73. I know that I'm not saying that, like, 
they're anywhere close to being done with what they've, you know, put together at that uh, place, but he's having to fill two coordinator spots. They still have the number one recruiting class in the country. It just like, it's, it's kind of fascinating. I, I don't think it's like a, uh, a fork in the road moment for the Alabama program by any means, but it is from an, the outside looking in. It's like, hmm, at the very least interesting, which way they go on this thing. Yeah. Somebody brought up the great point. Like, is there any other program in the country that could survive losing both their coordinators and there's no upheaval? Yeah. Like, there's no, like, oh, this guy's looking around now. This guy's not sure. Now I'm going to go play for Coach Saban. I'm good. Like, you know, and and you're talking about the number one class in the country. In Alabama, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, on the, the composite score, it was like the second highest score in, in history can, behind that A&M class last year. Yeah, and then, I mean, like you said, Saban doesn't seem to be slowing down. It's 73. I mean, that's just amazing. I did have this conversation with somebody the other day. Like, how much longer is realistic? Like, and we were talking about the Levy situation. Like, how how long is it realistic that Nick Saban's going to continue at this? I mean, is he going to go past 78? Does he have five more years left in him? At some point, you would think, like, with all the money in the world that he has, and I know he's crazy, would he not just want to say, F it, I'm out of this? I think he's one of those guys that as soon as, like, <laughs> this is kind of Like, dark. he's not going to get into TV. Like, you know, it's the couples where their wife dies and then the other one dies. Yeah. Like, short after. Like, if he, Alabama is his wife. Like, if he can't coach football anymore, he has no reason to live. Miss Terry might have something to say about yeah, that. Yeah. Or but, maybe she'd have uh, to pass or something for him to yeah. walk away. I, I know what you mean, though. Or he'd have to be Lee Corsoed out of re- into retirement. Yeah, I, I think there's two ways. Like, Alabama he dies on the field. <laughs> like, it, it, it's that level. Or secondarily, it's just a matter of, you know, I can't do it at the level that I expect to anymore. Like, and I, you know, for whatever reason, whether he's not as locked in as he used to be or kids don't connect with him the way they used to, you know, whatever it is. Do you think um, that there's been a discussion among some Alabama fans that are like, well, can we taxidermy him and just put him on the sideline? <laughs> just, just I mean, honestly, to, if, if, message board, if message board genius would have tweeted that out, I would have gone, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Like, that mm-hmm. sounds like something that somebody down there would say. Oh, uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's like a visit would just be weekend at Nick's. That's all it would be is an official visit weekend. So uh, him just, you know, somebody tying a, a rope to his arm and he's waving and yelling. Um, I don't think that's how taxidermy works, though. It'd be more like just having to get a picture with he'd have to permanent. They'd have to permanently like put his arm like it's going around someone so they could just stand in there and get a picture taken. <laughs> Alabama's like science, like their engineering program starts getting more into animatronics. Suddenly there's more investment over the next five years. You start wondering what that's about. Alabama would probably turn that into an NIL project and they would get even more five stars. <laughs> Maybe, maybe get like maybe that's where the Terminator comes from. Maybe that's how society ends. As Alabama invents the Terminator, they should have gave this a test run with Harvey Updike when he passed. <laughs> he would have donated his body for sure. Yeah, like uh, as a uh, instead of a, a, he, a uh, an organ donor, he's just a body donor. We're gonna try and figure out oh. how to organically make a Nick Saban robot. And if you think about it, Nick Saban has the face to be a Terminator. Like he has that rigid, like hard. Yeah. Like, uh, he, he could totally be the face of the next Terminator. No other podcast will give you this kind of breakdown, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, no other podcast, uh, at least not around here, will tell you about Dead Soxy either because, um, you know, they make custom socks for companies and organizations. Uh, they're custom socks. They, they make just incredible promotional gifts. You guys that are out there that have bought their socks know all about how great they are. Uh, you, can, you can use them for giveaways. Right now, we're uh, designing uh, the U40 socks that they're, they're going to be on sale soon. Uh, but uh, custom socks just might be the best promotional product that you've never tried. Uh, so you think about it. Every person you know wears socks every day, and, and they wear their favorite pairs a lot. Uh, so why not take advantage uh, of that knowledge and take fundraising or branding to a whole new level? Minimum order is only 100 pairs of the same style, and the lead time is just six to eight weeks. And right now, every custom order is $100 off. So get your project started now. Go to deadsoxy.com slash custom. That's D-E-A-D-S-O-X-Y.com slash custom to check out what they do with custom socks. And also, 
you just want a great pair of socks, go use that promo code uh, SCOOP, and you'll get 25% off your entire order, even sales uh, sales items. So deadsoxy.com slash custom. Go check them out, and as always, stay soxy. Uh, by the way, shout out to Josh Heupel. $9 million contract a year. If if you would if I would have asked you back in uh, I guess that would have been 2015 after you're coming back uh, after surviving what was a hellacious trip to Orlando and the Russell Athletic Bowl and I told you oh. in eight years Josh Hypo was going to make nine million dollars after an 11 win the head season coach at Tennessee at Tennessee yeah. what would you have said <laughs> like you're hallucinating I would have hallucinating bet you still? anything that you know I would just said how much money do you want to bet yeah we tried to put the company on the uh, OU Clemson game that wouldn't have worked out either though <laughs> maybe we're just bad gamblers God guys two years ago when he was hired we talked on this no, podcast I know. like I don't know how that's gonna go yeah like and I it I mean and again I I don't know that it's Josh's recruiting prowess that brought Nico I am I am Liava in I think I'm working on that I'm glad you said um, I've never said it. I just call him Nico if I, again I don't think it was being the great recruiter that let, let's just be honest Josh isn't but I hear a lot of things that as a head coach he's he's kind of found his zone on that. Like he, he's, you know, like better about it. He manages his time a little better. Um, and just, you know, has found a way to connect on his level to, to recruit. So I, I think he has gotten better in that regard, but guys, I, there was a big part of me that thought this was going to be a train wreck. Tennessee yeah. has been a train wreck for 20 years. And then throwing in a guy that's not exactly warm and fuzzy. I, I didn't know how that would go. He's a winner that I, I, I think maybe the biggest thing for me is I've been a little bit surprised how I think this is the term we'll, we'll just use a lot. And I think everybody kind of knows what it means, how SEC ready he's been. Yeah. To maybe, yeah. It, but he is a winner at the end of the day. Like Josh Heupel is a he winner is. that understands how to build a program because he was a part of a really obviously great program. I'm just surprised like how willing he's been to uh, maybe, maybe turn a blind eye to some stuff. Guys, and I don't even ha, want to say blind you, eye because it's all legal now. Like, I, but yeah, sure. I mean Tennessee. I mean they they're taking care of the recruiting for him. They've got some big sure. collectives up there, and I guess that shouldn't be necessarily surprising, knowing the type of passion and fervor that that fan base has just to be a part of the game. They're insane. They're right. nuts. Right. Yeah, we That's witnessed it. Yeah, it's what you need. Yeah, we, Guys, there was something, and I kind of heard it to in a fault passing, sometimes. so I can't say I've read the quote itself. But Danny White, you know, Tennessee's athletic director, said something about if you're interviewing a coach and he's talking to you about I'm going to need a couple of years to get this going, that's the wrong guy. And I was like, that is a really interesting thing. You know, obviously considering where Oklahoma was in year one and all like all that, I'm not trying to say this means anything. I'm just saying I thought it was a really interesting take. And you look at Josh, how he – Clearly in year one at Tennessee made progress. Obviously year two was a huge step forward. Uh, now OU fans could take solace in, Hey, you know, year one had its problems, but year two, okay. That that's when I, to me, and I, you know, I don't know how you guys feel, but that's when you start keeping score to me on things like in recruiting, like his Brent Venables, his first quote unquote class in 22, I don't take real stock of that good or bad. Like he kept a lot of guys that, that OU already had committed, landed a couple guys, you know, a couple have already left. Um, but that first class, his first full class looks outstanding. Uh, you know, we, we can get into the rivals re-rankings and how that Oklahoma's now moved up to the number six class in the country, all of those things. But to me, year two and almost everything, that's when I'm like, okay, like you, especially with the portal and everything and your ability to change your roster in a hurry, I feel like, this is the point when like you really start keeping score. Well, do you want to get into the, uh, just kind of the, I guess it's almost like putting a bow on the 2023 class. And I think that we've talked about it kind of time and time again, but I'm somewhat truly surprised that they were able to not only evaluate, I, I guess not surprised that they were able to evaluate, I'm surprised that this thing went as well as it did when you remember what they did for 13 games this season. It, it's stunning. I mean, it just is. I mean, to land, you know, what is Oklahoma's, I think, second-blessed class. I need to go back and look. I think 
2019, I think, finished five. Um, it's the only one that was clearly ranked ahead. And I want to say this is the second best class they've had since like 10, 08. Like, I mean, we're, we're, you're talking about a serious stretch of time. And Riley had some good classes. He had that three year stretch there where they finished in the top 10 that hadn't been done since like the mid 2000s under Bob. So uh, I, I think it, it says a lot. Now, what's interesting, guys, is we would talk at times under Riley about some of the offers they'd make. And, you know, oh, you look at, you know, look at this guy. And he was here when they offered him. And by the time it was done, he ended up here because he really took off during camps or whatever it was. Well, you see a lot of that in this group. Like Peyton Bowen was a Rivals 250 guy, ends up number 12 in the country. P.J. Atabari was a three-star that ends up number 21, and I, I think we still got him considerably underrated. Uh, Jackson Arnold, you know, was a Rivals 250 kid, ends up 23 in the country, the number five quarterback in the country. Like, you go down the list, like, guy, Macari Vickers finishes at number 81 in the country, which was a jump from any other point in his ranking. Samuel Omasigo was a three-star that nobody's talking about. He almost made the top 100, guys. Like, what I think is interesting, though, and I think which is, you know, like, that I know people are going – well, yeah, you said all the same crap about the Alex Grinch guys. I think this is where you see the developmental piece come in and where you see guys that can't, you know, like that are going to get, you know, Jay Valai is going to make Macari Vickers a better corner. Um, you know, Ted Roof, you know, say, say whatever you want. Ted Roof's got a ton of experience. I, I think he's going to make Samuel Omasigo, along with obviously Brent Venables being right there, going to make him a better player. Uh, you know, Peyton Bowen, guys – I don't think there's any position that grew more through the course of the year than safety. I thought that play got a lot better as the year went on, and that's a lot of credit to Brandon Hall. And now he gets to work with the guy that I, I think it's pretty clear from their actions and comments, and you could argue about Caleb Downs all you want, but Peyton Bowen was their number one safety target almost from the minute they showed up and saw his tape. Well, and then you add in the the transfer from Tech, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're you're a lot better at safety quick. Yep. You, you, you're talented and experienced. I mean, that, that secondary group, like you talk a couple years ago, we talked about, oh, the front seven looks really good, you know, with, uh, you know, Brian Osamoa and, you know, Perry on Winfrey and Isaiah Thomas and all this experience and talent they had. Now I feel like it's flipped. The defensive line's got to catch up, but that back seven looks extremely athletic and has a lot of good experience. Well, and I think that the other special part of it is that, you know, there were some guys, and, and, you know, they did lose some guys from the class, but for the most part, those guys that dealt with Brent Venables and Miguel Chavis and Todd Bates, like, they were able to hold on to, to all those guys, even though the defense wasn't great, you know, at time, you know, a lot of times this year. Like, it just shows you that they are really good at developing relationships. Guys, of their nine – that are in the rivals 250, six of them are on defense. That's that says a lot. I mean, and are from Oklahoma, Florida, Texas. I mean, like you go down the list, guys from all over um, Missouri. You know, you, you just kind of look at it and you're like, these guys really did work everywhere. And I think that's what's interesting is you know people keep making the big story about how much Oklahoma is working in the Southeast now because they're going to the SEC and Brent Venables and his staff are so familiar. And that's true. It's, it's not that I'm saying that's wrong. But what I think is the thing that really got lost since Brent Venables left, and I, I brought it up a couple of times kind of peripherally, but they are doing so much more work in Kansas City and St. Louis and Kansas and, you know, Kansas and Missouri in general than they had in years. And I, I, you know, again, like you look at their first class, some of their best players, Adabari, Green, I mean, you, you go down the, ro the the line and they had a lot of success recruiting that area. What would you say to somebody, and I'm not trying to be negative about this, just as far as like specifically with Todd Bates, I think everybody knows that they need to get some wins and particularly in the 2024 class on the defensive line. I like what they did in the portal, but what would you say to somebody that says that they're just not seeing it with Todd, Todd Bates? What, what would the response be to that? I, and I'm not believe, I don't believe that I'm just saying for people out there, because people have asked me like, should you be happy with what they've done? And like, obviously you want to see them sign the five-star defensive tackle, 
uh, join the party, though. Every person in the country does. And that's the thing. Like, you lost – I mean, the guy that they really put all the chips on the table for is David Higgs. Right. And they lost him. And do I think it has anything to do with Todd Bates' ability as a recruiter? Hell no. I think all things equal, or if this is five years ago, David Hicks goes to Oklahoma. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't have a lot of doubt about that. Um, it just, you're playing a little bit of a different game now than you used to. So, uh, now they've got to adapt to that. There's, there's no question. But to me, if Oklahoma goes out this year and doesn't get Danny Okoye, who, who guys... I want to be really clear. I'm not betting on Oklahoma and Danny Okoye right now. Like I, I think that is going to be a tough hill to climb because they're, I think Danny is one of those types. And I probably relate to it because I'm kind of that way too. He likes to do the unexpected. He likes to be like, it's why he's at Noah that this kid that could go play at IMG is at Tulsa Noah a homeschool program. And I don't mean any offense to those guys. They won the national championship at their level. They, they, they run a very good program there at NOAA, but it's a homeschool program. It's not where you typically find six foot five, 230 pound guys who have NFL futures. Like that, that that's not the norm. Um, so I, I think there is some element of maybe he's going to do something and surprise people. Um, but you go get David Stone, you go get Nigel Smith, you go get, you know, some of these guys that we've talked about in this podcast then you're fine. Williams Maneri, another kid from, from the Kansas city area. Um, you go get those guys and you're fine. Like this is all like, it's all good. But if you start missing out on these guys that you did get the head start on, and then guys like David stone that grew up kind of an OU fan and, and, and really, you know, it seems like it's all there for you to go get him. You lose that guy. Then that's a problem. I mean, it, it just is like you, you, there's not enough of these guys in the state of Oklahoma that you can afford to miss out on them. You have to get – when there's a big body in your backyard – guys, you know, I, I heard somebody talking about this the other day, and they're dead right. You give me the choice of Trevor Lawrence or an elite four-man defensive line class, I'm taking the defensive line class every time. Like, no, it's not – and it's not even a thought. Like, Georgia just won a national title with Stetson Bennett. Yeah. Like, you – it's the one position offensive line. We've talked about it over and over again. It's why I think if you made me bet, I, I might pick Logan Howland as the offensive lineman. I would bet is a future top 10 pick out of this class. And he's ranked way behind Caden green, but you look at the type of offensive linemen that become stars. They come from stories like Logan Howland, like that, that, that is a very, very familiar thing. Um, but what I what I with the defensive line, man, it's usually the elite guys. Those elite dudes become elite NFL guys, and that's there's no way around that. You can't. There's not enough of them, and it's why Georgia and Alabama and, the, and largely the SEC have ruled college football for the last twenty years because they have they've had the best guys up front, and they just beat the crap out of you up front. I think that was like the one thing that I don't know if you become depressed watching it and it's not depressing, but because it's almost just so unbelievable how talented some of those guys are, uh, you know, when we go to these rivals camps or obviously when we, you know, watch the national championship game, like a bear Alexander going out there and dominating as a freshman, it's just like, it's a di like the the fourth or fifth best defensive tackle on Georgia would be the number one defensive tackle at a lot of places. It 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 I don't know it it it's tough to like put into perspective how far the Georgia Alabama maybe even the LSU's of the world are in terms of defensive line ahead of everybody. Else. Yeah, like it just they have the guys that the other everybody else is fighting for and they just can't get. Well, guys, the, the best example that OU fans, you know, I hate to bring it up, but it, like it is, it is something they'll remember. Look at that 2008 offensive line for Oklahoma. Your starting tackles were one of the best left tackles that's ever played the game. And Trent Williams, Phil Lodeholt was your right tackle, a 10-year NFL starter. Uh, you had John Cooper, who would have been a longtime NFL guy if not for an injury. And I realized at that point in his career, the injury had already happened, but he was still a really good college center. 
And then you had a couple of good, solid guards. Like, they, they got in that goal line situation with Florida and couldn't move them because yeah. Florida had a whole bunch of freaking dudes up front. And that Oklahoma, again, that Oklahoma offensive line, that's not the kind of offensive line that comes together very often. That many NFL guys in one group, that's not normal. Well, especially shouldn't have run the guys ball of that behind. caliber. Shouldn't have, they picked the wrong guy to run the ball behind on that line. Well, well and if DeMarco doesn't you know. get hurt, I mean, they... Oh, probably, God. But then again, I'd probably die that night in Miami. So there's like a win-win <laughs> there. It's like a win-loss type of thing. And even I, I like, have some buddies that pushed it to the, to the very edge of death on that evening, win or lose. I think I fell asleep in the uh, downstairs hotel. I was definitely... I, I, I fell asleep. I didn't pass out. Uh, it like it, look at 2017 though. Like look at Oklahoma's offensive line and what they had to go against against Georgia's defensive line. And all that was an all time game. But same rings true. They had, I mean, Roquan Smith was running everywhere. Like they just had freaks. And but, I know and he they wasn't still worth the lineman, Georgia that they are now. I no, mean, I mean it's 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 gone up a level. Fortunately, my it, quarterback evaluation skills were. Not uh, that time, that that part of my life was not good. I love me some Jake from Jake, Jake from Jake from State Farm. You know, like you you you, you got to have your love. You know, your first your first quarterback crush. Um, I God coming out of that, like it was like, well, I mean, look what he's doing. I, he should have beaten Alabama that year. Um, you know, won a national title right there. He should he should have Stetson Bennett's life. Um where he's never, ever going to have to pay for anything in Athens, Georgia. I never even thought about that, like how, like he's, he might as well not even have played football at Georgia now. Went to a national championship As a freshman and nothing. I mean, Stetson's Stetson's the one that's going to be at. uh, That's identity theft is what that is. Stetson's going to be the one that's getting invited to Berkman's place at Augusta National. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe Jake Fromm does, but it'll be to valet someone's car. Sorry, Jake. (laughs) I mean, uh, he didn't even have – he hasn't even had a uh, – uh, what's his name that was with the Rams that was playing um, at the end of the year? Uh, Baylor guy. Uh, Bryce Petty? No, 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 no. Um, Jared Stidham. Oh, Stidham. Like, yeah, Jared yeah, yeah. Stidham's had a better NFL career so far than Jake Fromm did. Yeah. Which I always liked Jared Stidham. I thought he was going to tear it up when he went to Auburn. I did when he too. left Baylor. I did too. But that thing was obviously uh, kind of doomed from the start, wasn't it? I guess just uh, as far as like wrapping up the defensive tackle uh, conversation, I know that, you know, there's been some, I don't even know how we want to characterize this. Like, I guess I'll just ask, what, what's up with David Stone in Michigan State? <laughs> like, uh, it has uh, to be know, talked about. Yeah. You know, there is um... – I guess the news that moved the needle for a lot of people, I think it was yesterday, Chad Simmons uh, from on three put in a forecast for David Stone or whatever they call it. I can't, I don't even know what it is. Every, every network's got their own thing for it. Uh, A prediction. Let's just make it simple for everybody out there that maybe doesn't follow it that closely. A prediction for David Stone to go to Michigan state. And I, there are a few guys in the business I think more of than Chad Simmons. And this is, you know, David's at IMG Academy now. Uh, I'm sure Chad is getting this from reputable places. I want to be clear to people. It won't shock me at all if David Stone was to commit to Michigan State tomorrow. Like that, that I don't think that's a shocking turn of events. At the same time, it wouldn't change my feeling that he eventually signs with Oklahoma. Like, I, I just, I think... You know, I know people kind of get hung up on, well, he's going to Michigan State and he was there last month and blah, blah, blah. He said it on Twitter, guys. Like, I go to Oklahoma all the time. I just don't tweet about it. My sister goes to school there. Like, you know, like there is, there's so much that happens between David and Oklahoma that nobody else talks about. And I think some of that is by David's design because I think he likes to downplay Oklahoma's presence because he's worked really hard to get schools to take him seriously. Like, yeah, I'm going to look at your program. I mean, I'm interested in your program because so many think, well, he's just going to go to Oklahoma. And I, I guess David needs to work harder to change my feeling about it. But I, I just, I think that's where he's most comfortable. I think he loves Todd Bates. I think he's got a great relationship with that staff and I, 
I think under the previous regime, he loved those guys as well. He really did. But I think there was always this concern in the back of their, his mind, like, are they going to develop me into the first round guy that, you know, that everybody thinks David has the ability to be. And whether you feel they would have or not, doesn't really matter. Like these guys can point to it and say, sure, of course we've done it before. We'll do it again. Like, and I think that is what's going to be really hard for anybody else to overcome because I, to me, if I, if I'm Oklahoma, I'm like Michigan state. Yeah, sure. That that's a race. We'll, we'll be happy to run. No problem. Um, because Michigan state doesn't have those things. They don't have that ability to say, Oh yeah, we've, we've done this and we've done that. And, or at least not to any level that compares with Brent Venables and Oklahoma and those things. I mean, Mel Tucker's got a great track record, but it, it's not the same. Um, so we'll, we'll see I, again, if he does commit, I would just tell people don't get crazy. Don't let it alarm you. Just ride this out. Remember Peyton Bowen, you, that, that thing even I thought was done and wasn't done. This staff does a really good job of running the race till the absolute last second. What is it about Michigan State? Like I'm from the Mel out- Tucker might not even be the coach by the end of the From the, the year. very outside looking in, it's just like I don't understand it. Like how are they recruiting so well? I, I and I think part of it is this, Eddie, is and I you know, I know um you know, I've mentioned before listening to the Andy Staples podcast, and they, they talk a lot about kind of the plan that's in place there and some of the things they've heard. And because, you know, I won't claim I know Michigan State's inner workings that well. But what I can say is they really push hard to get these early commitments. There's a lot of um, let's get out in front and then see if we can hold on or, you know, and almost develop some momentum, you know, like, Hey, if we can get this guy, maybe this guy will jump on it. And then we kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like, Hey, I want to play with those guys. And I think that's the thinking here. Um, and I think it explains a lot of it while we know Oklahoma is just, you know, kind of a, I don't want to say the tortoise because that, that makes it sound like they're not working. They're working plenty hard they're just not going to push for these things. They, they want it to happen more organically and they want the kid to, you know, be sure, Hey, I'm done. Like this is it. David Stone commits to Michigan state tomorrow. He's still taking visits. He's still talking to other schools, make no mistake about it. That's not what Oklahoma wants. So they'll let him do that and they'll keep recruiting him. So, um, I, I think that's a big part of it because Michigan state, like the way they recruit, they're recruiting the type of players like they're at Georgia and they're not at Georgia. And you look at their classes, they're getting good, solid players, but you look at who they were, you know, in on this time last year and people were talking about, they didn't get most of those guys. Like there was a lot of talk of Sam Snoke and Lola, Sam Snoke and Lola went to Miami, you know, is, is on the John Ruiz plan. So there is, there's just a lot there that you're like, I don't, I don't think this needs to be, as big a concern as is if, if David Stone was like, I'm really high on Georgia. Okay. That that's, that's a legitimate threat. Like we we've seen it. Michigan state. I, again, like it's not that he doesn't like them. I'm not saying that at all. He 100% does. I just don't know if they can run the race with Oklahoma until December. There it is. Josh has turned his back on his childhood program. I grew up with a starter jacket, people. Okay? A lot of love for that green and white. It's not easy for me to say these things, but it is what it is. How did you even face your friends after they beat <laughs> Eduardo Nahara and broke a young Eddie Radosovich's heart? <laughs> I That was one of the most torn games of my life because I loved Mateen Cleaves. I loved all the, like, those, those were my guys. Um, and... But at the same time, I was like, OU's not going to go all the way. Like, could. OU could beat Michigan State here. If they hadn't intentionally taken out Eduardo, Mateen Cleese with his they, giant forehead. <laughs> you know, hey, hey, he's that got the would, ring. Okay? That, that so really, that would have been maybe the number. If they had been able to come back in that game with, with Nahara coming out of the locker room like that, like that would have been one of the greatest victories in OU basketball history. Maybe number one. That was one. a great Michigan State team. Yeah. A really, it was a really, really good, good game. State team. I mean. It was. And it was exactly what you knew coming in. Like, Samson, 
like the whole like well there are mere images of each other yeah i mean yes yeah it, it, it's kind of like you know when we were talking about in, in the going to the playoffs where you're like okay you know michigan is or ohio state's got to play georgia now georgia's just michigan on steroids michigan state at that time was just ou on steroids like yeah they were they were just bigger and more athletic but the same like we're going to hit you in the mouth. We're going to, it's going to be physical for 40 minutes. Like that's what they believed in. And obviously that was OU's whole, you know, plan of attack at that point in time. It's amazing. Josh talked more about basketball than he ever has. Just got to get late nineties, Michigan state talk. <laughs> that's all you got to oh, do. I, I guy, like, And all you suckers. I, that I was got... talking to Tiffany about this. I, I was talking to Tiffany about this yesterday. Like, cause you guys were talking about the game and we were out having dinner and I was like, basketball is just one of those things. Like I can't with kids and married and like I, I had to choose something. And I was like, I'd rather keep watching soccer than college basketball. Cause I, like I can go to Tiffany and be like, Hey, like last Sunday, Arsenal plays Manchester United. I'm like, you guys do whatever you want. I want to watch this for two hours. I don't give a shit about most college basketball games. Like I, I just, I, I have surrendered that part, but once upon a time, I like I could tell you Duke seventh man like I, I knew who was coming off the bench like I was that into it and I watch it just like I do college football but it was just one of those sacrifices of time where I was like I don't have enough hours in the day to be you know the kid I was at 20 when I didn't have anything to do except occasionally go to class and drink too much alcohol by the way all you suckers you got rid of those starter jackets you lost a lot of money yeah they're worth a lot aren't they yeah a lot like crazy i i had mine well into my into the 2000s and it's just because my grandmother wouldn't get rid of it like um it was in her coat closet for years and then when she passed i was like i don't need this anymore and it was like probably 2003 like i i kept it longer than most people did and now i'm like good god that would have been you know that that wouldn't been a bad thing to have at all I bet your dad could sell his OU jacket for a pretty penny, that one you posted about. I don't think time. he ever would. I think we're going to keep that in the Is he band. Is going to get buried in it? Well, no, we're going to keep it. Do something with it. No, Dad, you can't be buried with that. That's our jacket, too. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's how Eddie's going to pay for the service. He's going to sell the jacket. It might. I mean, by then, it might be worth something. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's on the table. All right, well, i got to say, uh, it did... Uh, it did perk me up when I just saw an email from Eric Hollier uh, because I saw the names Jackson Nicholas and John Spikerman. Yeah, all Big 12 first team selections today. It, uh, it It's crazy to say, but I mean, my God, it's January 25th. Baseball's right around the corner. Uh, I know. I that, think everybody fell in love with OU baseball again last year. Sure. And I, I think that there's a lot of people that look at the uh, preseason top 25s that are coming out and you know, OU wasn't a part of the D1 baseball uh, top 25. And I think at first you go, the hell? Like, were they screwed? But, I mean, they just lost so much on the weekend. Uh, I mean, everything on the weekend, just as far as starters go. Yeah. That it's not, you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't be over-concerned. Uh, they're going to, they feel like they're going to be very, very good offensively. Uh, they're going to steal a lot of bases. The chaos is going to be back. I, in fact, I think they might be better than they were a year ago offensively. Uh, it's just going to be about what they do on the weekends and the pitching rotation and in, in the Big 12 that's going to be good yet again. And, uh, you know, I think that Skip has enough track record right now with uh, with pitchers that everything's going to be okay. They just got to go out and kind of prove it. Interested to see uh, what that Arlington series looks like this year. Yeah, that should be pretty fun. I March 3rd through 5th, I think, is the is the dates on that. Or is that the Frisco one? They're going down there twice. Uh, I... I might try to go down to that. It's going to be pretty good, though. Uh, and also some news. Uh, I know people were going to kill us if we didn't do this, but we will have softball coverage this year at Sooner Scoop. This should be fun. It was. It's hilarious looking at the, uh, like, as much as I pay attention to it, like looking at the top, you know, like 80 players in the country for softball and stuff. Well, they just released. Like, OU's, OU's literally their starting roster is – Usually, like, I think eight of the top 20. Well, here's, here's, here what, this is what tells you how good OU softball is. Eight players have been named to the player of the year watch list. It's insane. Eight players. The, your entire lineup <laughs> is, is player of the year watch list material. It, it's literally insane. 
it, it's like I said, and, and I, I will say, guys, I, I don't know about you all, but that probably more than any other team. And I've said it before that that's the team that like I find myself like rooting for a little bit. I'm like, I, cause I don't cover them. I don't feel the same need to be apart from it. Like they're, they're just, it's amazing to watch what they do to really good teams. And it seems like the golf is only getting big. It, this feels like Alabama in like 2012, like where they've been really good. They've got a couple national titles, but like, you're like, this is getting bigger. This gap between them and everybody else, because of the way Patty recruits and just, you're like, like, cause every, you guys talked about the top 80 players. Not just or how she recruits, but you how she at, gets transfers too. She like the best, the best, best players from yeah. the other teams. That, that's yeah. why it's gotten even crazier. Um, she's like Nick Saban. Look at like the, She's like she's worse than Nick Saban. No, she's, I mean, as she's far Nick as other Saban with concerned. Lincoln Riley's like uh, ability to go get the best players every year. Yeah, uh, it, it it's because cr- like you look at their recruiting, like and it'll be the top twenty players, and like six of them are going to Oklahoma. You're like, how 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 does someone compete with that? That'd be like if Nick Saban signed thirty of the top one hundred. Like that that's not that shouldn't be possible. Frisco College Baseball Classic. Cal, Mississippi State, Ohio State at Dr. Pepper Ballpark. That's March 3rd through 5th. That's what I was thinking of. Hmm. It's a nice little ballpark. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Right over by my uh, parents' house. Yeah, over there in Frisco, mm-hmm. right off the highway. Uh, no, it, it should be really good. And, I, you know, I think that some of these uh, preseason top 25s are coming out. And OU's wanted a lot of them. And no issues, either two or three in the other one. So, the, the softball is rather strong in this state. There's no change about that. Yeah, Kenny's done a really good job up in Stillwater. Yeah. And All right. I, I did want to say real quickly, like, we're not far away from camp season getting going. I've already, you know, I've sent some stuff to you guys as I start to look at different places. And, I mean, we're we're going to have to hit the road for some camp. I mean, and when I say we, it'll largely be me. But um, there are camps all over the place that I, I'm really going to try to make an honest effort to see as many of them as I can. Um, there is, like I said, I mean, with, with Oklahoma working in Florida and Georgia and some of the places that where they've always tried, but I think they're now starting to see more success because of who they have on staff and who they know and their connections. Um, it'll be interesting. Like I said, the first, first big one is only like two weeks away, which I don't know that I'll be at that one, but it gives you an idea of like how rapidly some of this stuff is coming up on us. And we got spring football just around the corner as well. So mm-hmm. spring game's already been announced April 22nd. Uh, so, yeah, a uh, lot of stuff. I'll, I'm looking forward to it getting busy again. So um, it's been a lot of fun. So and it's going to be fun watching watching some stuff on the field with the football team, uh, lot, especially the new faces and guys like Jaron Canick and, and uh, guys that are going to start pushing for starting jobs. So uh, Robert Spears Jennings and guys like that. So. All right, uh, I think uh, I think that's it uh, for this week's edition. We appreciate everybody being a part of it. Remember, SoonerScoopStore.com, fully stocked. Eddie is just ready to ship some stuff. He hasn't had enough stuff to ship lately. He needs more. He needs more orders. So, uh, go SoonerScoopStore.com. Get your uh, Lindsey Street gear ready for the uh, season. Maybe you can wear that to the spring game and and uh, continue the movement. That'd be nice. Need something. Might have some uh, news on some new shirt. Here before spring gets, yes, uh, gets working going on, too. working on something right now. I think we have a pretty good idea that uh, I think people would rather enjoy. All right. Uh, that's going to do it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Also, Soonerscoop.com. Go uh, uh, subscribe for all our inside stuff on the message boards and all that good stuff, like uh, the woke that jo- the jo- woke Oklahoma that Josh posted this morning. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll be back again uh, for another edition of the Unofficial 40 Podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com.